Okay, um, so we're gonna get started. Hello everyone and on the internet too. Welcome everyone to our Friday night instructor presentation. Um, yeah, if this is your first time joining us for one of these nights, here's how it works. Our visiting instructors take turns giving 10 minute presentations about their work and themselves. And that's how it works, the end. Um, it's a really fun night and we're glad you're here for it. So we're gonna get started. Um, we have three uh, instructors presenting tonight. Our first instructor up is Lucy Jockel from the Fine Metal Studio. Yes. Usually our assistants introduce our instructors, but I'm gonna be introducing Lucy because I was her assistant back in the day and I wanna do it. Um, so I'm gonna pull up her slideshow and then I'm gonna do the introduction. And this is how that's going to work. Like this, usually I'll, you know, I'd be doing this and the next person would be coming in and doing it, but this is fine too. And you do this like this, you go view, right? Mm -hmm. Present over here. Someone want to help me out? There we go, right there. Okay. All right. So Lucy Jockel, our instructor at the Fine Metal Studio, who is teaching Memento's Cold Connections. She received her MFA in jewelry and metal smithing from Rhode Island School of Design in 2016 before serving as the 2017 Fine Metals Artist Fellow here at Peters Valley. Um, I wrote this down, I already said it, where I was lucky enough to be her assistant, uh, which is why I'm introducing her because I'll always be her assistant. Uh, she, <laughs> she currently works as a lecture coordinator at Townsend University in Baltimore, Maryland. She commonly works with motifs of Victorian morning jewelry, memento mori, and the interconnectivity between humans and animals. Please help me in welcoming these. Glad you didn't make me cry because I could have easily cried right there, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. It's so good to be here um, back at Peters Valley. Um, I was here in 2017, so it's been a little bit and it's a little bit nostalgic, um, but also feels like I never left at the same time. So it's really weird, but I I'm so glad that I'm back. Um, so the workshop I'm teaching is Memento's Cold Connections, as Talia said. And um, we're working on transforming found materials or found objects into wearable mementos. Um, and we're working on like different cold connections. So this is really a part of my own practice. This piece uh, specifically is um, deer bone and I used silver to kind of create these staples um, to talk about repair and it's a brooch. So every piece that you'll be seeing is wearable. And I'll talk a little bit about thousand for a second. So I'm currently teaching there. I've been teaching there for about three years. Can you hear me? Is, turn it up. Switch it on. Can you hear me better now? Oh, so weird. Is it good? Okay. All right. So I'm currently teaching at Towson University. I'm the lecturer and area coordinator there. Um, and I've been there for, this is going to be my third year. This is some student work um, of my amazing students. Um, the first one on the left was during the pandemic and she did all of these cold connections and that kind of also inspired this workshop a little bit um, where she didn't need, basically that just means you don't need a torch. Um, and she did this all at home, which was pretty incredible. Um, then we have casting in the center and then enameling, um, which was kind of uh, a color on metal project. Is that, should we bring it back a little? Okay, um, so going back a little bit further, my parents are antique dealers and that's really left an impression on me. Um, they've had weird things in the house all of my life. Um, and this is, this is my dad's truck. It's just like filled with a bunch of junk. <laughs> and um, so I was really surrounded by storytelling told by um, between dealers and buyers. And that kind of inspired me to think more about these materials and these remains and their history and the story that they bring with them. Um, so this is a picture of when I was little and my parents brought home this chair of like deer and moose antlers. And clearly that's left an impression on me because I've ever since, not ever since that moment, but um, have collected kind of weird oddities all my life. Um, yeah, my dog, that's my old dog and he's like wants to eat that chair currently at that moment. But um, here's a, this is a fan. My parents set up at this uh, flea market called Brimfield three times a year. 
And this was the one object that my mother had in her booth. She sets up at like this textile um, flea market. And this was made out of um, buffalo hide and carved horn. And this, the history and the story behind it was really interesting, but also I really connected with the material and the piercing is very similar to how um, metal is treated. So um, I thought that was just a really interesting piece. Um, so this is my latest large piece that I worked on. It was a, um, a commission for the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. And they contacted me because I'd gone there for grad school and they knew about my work and that I, I worked with honeybee wings and it really represents um, mourning and remembering honeybees and talking about kind of our disconnection with nature and that our effect on that animal specifically or that insect. Um, and so they knew that about my work and they contacted me about this commission. They had beehives on the roof and um, they passed all the, all the bees died over, over winter because it was a harsh winter. Rhode Island winters are crazy. Um, and so they sent me all of their dead bees and um, I made this neck piece in kind of memorial for them. And I have, this was, it was based on one of the paintings in their, their collection of the portrait of a woman in a lace hood. And so I, I looked to that for the design of the piece. And this is a movie so, or a video, a uh, quick video, just to show you kind of what, what it looks like when it's lifted. Um, it becomes kind of like this textile. And so my work is in between like jewelry wearables, textile um, realm, and really thinking about like the delicacy of specifically the honeybee, but every, every object and every material that I'm working with or remain that I'm working with um, really considers the fragility of, of our ecosystem, of our animals. So there's that. And this work started back, back in RISD, but this was a piece I made at Peters Valley. Um, and I worked on this the entire summer. I don't even know if I finished it by the end of summer, but um, it took me a really long time, but I, I started this project and then I ended up shipping this to Germany and learned a really good lesson about how to ship delicate things um, because, so there's a ring on the end that's metal and I secured it on the way there, but they didn't on the way back. So the whole thing was jumbled up when it came back. And it really, it made me realize like really what my work is about too, because this is fragile and it's kind of about the, um, ephemerality of life anyways. So that made it a little bit easier to kind of let that go, but it was also kind of horrible at the same time that all that work was ruined just in on the way back home. Um, this was a piece that I made in during the pandemic and in response to the pandemic. Um, it was a part of the One World exhibition at Gallery Loop. And it is, I will play the video, let's see here. So it's obsidian um, that I carved and I placed the honeybee wings in. And I really wanted to, I guess, after work like the one I just showed you, I kind of wanted a way that the honeybee wings were secure enough to be worn more in an everyday wearable type of piece. So I carved the obsidian that changes in the light. And it was really thinking about grief and kind of letting the light in and thinking about the balance between like lightness and the heaviness of that time. And my work really references um, Victorian morning rituals, which is what our class is talking about tomorrow. And um, this is a piece that was made, they're called lover's eyes and the, um, somebody's lover's eye would be painted on either ivory or, or some type of material um, set in a brooch. And then if there were like eye droplets, like, diamonds in this piece that would mean it was a morning piece and so that last piece was in reference to kind of the teardrops um, and the morning jewelry. Um, there was a major shift in my work after I curated an exhibition at Towson University called All Decked Out and we had planned this way before the pan pandemic but it happened during the pandemic and um, the theme of it was really about like having a party and getting all decked out in that moment of just like adorning yourself totally. And it was, so it was kind of, it was a strange time to be doing this, but it also was kind of a relief. And I realized um, 
So these are some of the works in the exhibition. I, we included everything that was connected to adornment. So the piece on the left is ceramics, but she was adorning the surfaces and kind of seeing the ceramic um, as the body. And then um, work that incorporated hair and all, type, all types of um, materials. Um, but I really realized that, um, I don't know, that was a brightness that I kind of wanted in my work and kind of wanted to see through a little bit more. We have like a minute left. Um, I also curated this exhibition with my collective, JV Collective, and um, it incorporated a lot of works where, as it says, it's an exhibition of necklaces and pendants tackling adolescence. So it was looking back at high school and creating works that were in reference to that. And the work there too was really vibrant and kind of just thinking it was fun and light and it was really just thinking of that time in everybody's life and and that also influenced my work personally to where now I'm making this body of work that I don't have a title for yet but I'm incorporating a lot more color and kind of considering yeah I, I never I always just worked in like neutral tones and thinking about memorials where I'm now thinking about works that are forming into like these um, I don't even know how to describe yet because it's so new, but um, they're kind of these materials that would grow from pollution is kind of the basic idea. Um, so that is where I'm at. I'll just go, I have two more slides. Um, this is another project I'll be showing with my sister at New York City Jewelry Week in November, and she's a ceramicist. So we're kind of collaborating on ideas that's in the works. And the next project I have, I'm going across America um, on a road trip with a photographer and we're gonna be collaborating. Um, he works kind of like large scale landscape and I work really micro and on our way, I'm gonna be doing installations and thinking about kind of like the ecosystems at a micro level and he's gonna be thinking like larger scale. So that's where I'm at. And this was us in 2017 and there's Talia and Lucky, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thanks, Lucy. That was really good. Okay. Um, next, we have David Abiel from the Woodworking Studio. I'm here to introduce him is the woodworking assistant Kat Nash. And excuse me, so I'm just gonna put it up first. I know how to do it now. We go there and we go there, so easy. Hello, uh, I am Kat Nash, the woodworking assistant here at Pierce Valley. I'm here today to introduce David Abiel, who is a, who's teaching a Windsor fine furniture class this week. David is a woodworker from Traverse City, Michigan, which actually happens to be where I was born. David has a master's degree in social work from the University of Washington and recently retired from a 40 year career running human service agencies. So he could do what he loves most, making Windsor furniture. He now teaches chair making classes in Michigan and five other states at folk schools, art centers and community colleges. Please join me in welcoming David Abiel. Thanks, Kat, and thanks, uh, Peters Valley. It's great to be back, and we've had some beautiful weather these last couple of days, even though I know you've, you've had lots of, lots of rain here. If I want to advance the slideshow, I just... Uh, the down key? The right key. No, return. There we go. Got it. All right. Return has got me. Um, we are doing a Windsor chair class for the three days of uh, today, uh, tomorrow, and, and Sunday. If you want to join us, we still have two-day projects. So you can join us and make a bench still uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Just got to contact the office very early in the morning. Um, I love Windsor chairs because it's functional sculpture. And so I get to be an artist, but I also get to kind of, there's a very practical side to this. There's two ways you measure success. It's comfort and a lot of practical sorts of questions about engineering. But then there's also the functional side, the beauty side. The, is this something that, that looks cool and that you really want in your house? Will it fit with other things? And so that's the, the perpetual challenge that we're up against. As you can see, this is a row of rocking chairs uh, down in North Carolina recently. So I'm gonna show you some slides of some of the work we're doing in class. 
And then I'm going to show you some of the tools that we're using in class. And I know you're all going to be so excited at the end. You're going to say, great, I'm going to sign up to do a, a Windsor piece of furniture next year. And this is a, a cradle that I did uh, a number of years ago. I don't have any kids that young anymore, but uh, it kind of demonstrates that Windsor furniture doesn't necessarily have to be a chair. It's defined by a slab and stick construction technique. And so you have a slab of wood or a, a plank of wood into which all of the structure above and all the structure below is supported. And so in this case, you have the two rockers and you have all that uh, spindle work up above. And that's, a, a, in my definition anyway, a Windsor piece of furniture. Here's another one, a little tiny shorty guy. I call this my Datsun or my wiener dog series. And this was made by a student up in uh, Grand Marais, Minnesota. And uh, it's really a cute little stool, very short little legs. And we're doing some of this as a practice in our, our current class, kind of as a warm-up exercise for some of the bigger benches that we're building. And uh, this was a pair of, uh, we call it a double H stretcher stool. You can see the two uh, double stretchers down the middle of the stool here. Um, very comfortable and really cool. The simplest of materials, that's what I like about this. Uh, the materials are not expensive. They're readily available everywhere in the country. And um, it's, you can be, show a lot of creativity as well as nod to tradition as you're doing various designs. This was a piece that was done by a novice who had never done any woodworking before last summer here at Peters Valley. And uh, I think she did a terrific job. And just with that green, nice, beautiful green, lush setting up on Thunder Mountain Road, uh, it was so pretty. I had to take a picture and, and include it in our slideshow here. Lots of creativity is shown. This person is carving some extra uh, frills around the edge of her seat. And here's a guy pounding in his, his arm uh, wedging. Um, the engineering is very important, and we spend a lot of time in that in class, how to drill compound angles so that your leg not only sticks forward 10 degrees, it sticks out 10 degrees. Things like that we talk a lot about. And you can see you can be very creative with your benches. You can throw a, a, an extra piece of um, walnut in this case and kind of have a natural edge to it and just kind of really do some cool things. Here's another one with a bug, a bug eaten edge. On this on the stool and there's that little shorty stool in front of it a nice combination for your for your back door i call it the back door boot bench you know you kind of slide in put your boots on and head out for the to greet the day and we use walnut um, maple a lot of cherry this is walnut believe it or not look at the variety of colors in that array of legs that we're going to be using for some of our benches there's blues and there's greens and there's uh, whites and it's just a, a wonderful variety of a hues that you can get with some of these materials. Here's another material we're using, which is, uh, we call it ambrosia maple. There's an ambrosia beetle, which sneaks into the wood. You can see a little tiny hole there at the top of that um, uh, stain. And, and there's a bacteria on the bug's legs, which then stains the, the tree as it's growing. And so here it is, a, is a stretcher that we've turned from that piece of wood, just makes for an interesting combination. This is Will McDonald. Thanks to Jamie, by the way, and Kat, who are my, my two uh, uh, wood uh, uh, facility assistants here during this week. This is Will McDonald from last year, and he made a bench for the auction, did a beautiful job. If you judge a successful chair, I believe you have to have comfort first and priority. If it's not comfortable, you're not gonna use it. You're not gonna keep it. It has to serve a purpose too. Big clunky, heavy furniture generally doesn't last long. It's usually in the garage sale. It has to be strong and stable, well-engineered, at portable, light, both physical. This chair is a good example, I think, about light. It's very, uh, you can see through it. So it has, a, it has a very light visual and physical presence in the room. It's proportional, it's functional sculpture. So it's really cool stuff. It's practical, but it also has an artistic sort of flair to it. A good sit. Um, and I brought a sample here. Folks on Zoom won't be able to appreciate it, but I brought a sample. I want everybody in the audience tonight to at least sit in that chair for a second. And then your line is to say, oh, this is the most comfortable chair I've ever sat in when you, when you, when you sit there. But seriously, um, this is a piece that we're going to be making in the next, next class. Uh, right now, we've got two rockers underway, three side chairs, and a couple benches. So we've got a nice variety of projects, and the, and the class is doing a great job. Um, we try to make sure that we have enough space for our spine right in the middle of our chair. So we use an even number of spindles, which is a little bit of a sacrilegious thing. Uh, generally, Windsor Furniture has seven, nine, 
11 for the furniture, for the spindle number. And it's that center spindle that always bugs you right in the back of your back. So you're either trying to move to the left or you're trying to move to the right and you can never quite get comfortable. So if we eliminate that middle spindle and go with eight, 10 or 12 spindles, I think you have a much more comfortable set. A little bit of flexibility helps that lumbar bend. Uh, spindle spacing, I like to put things on one inch center so they're really packed in tight. And I think that improves the comfort. Uh, we don't have any horizontals in the back of our chair here. And that's uh, because it's either too high or too low. Everybody's body is shaped differently. And so no matter where I put it, it's either too high or it's too low. So I don't have any horizontals going across the back of our chair. We just have verticals. The angle of the back is important. We're gonna come in somewhere around 14 to 17 uh, degrees back for a nice lean. And we're gonna have a wide landing for our arms, nice, nice wide arms. A lot of times in spindle and construction, you're gonna see a lot of skinny pieces. And I don't like that because I don't think it's very comfortable. Here we left the, um, the travisure marks that one of the tools we were used to make our chairs. We left them on the seat. You can see the patina that it leaves behind. We like to drill as our chair is being assembled and that way we don't have to do a lot of complicated um, angle um, uh, measurement and then try and replicate that on a device where you're holding device where you're doing your drilling. And here we are doing some bending. I like to boil my pieces as opposed to steam them. It gets them plenty hot and soft. Today, we sort of forgot about our pieces. They boiled all during the lunch hour. And so by the time the afternoon rolled around, they were almost like rubber. They, they were just terrific. They bent very easily. And we had some, everybody was successful. There were no, no situations where you uh, broke the cones. These are, um, I call them uh, um, pencil sharpeners, but they're really tenon cutters. And they can give you a variety of diameters for the fitting between a mortise, which is the hole and the, and the tenon. That's how you do your basic construction. This is just another version with a more of a taper that also is a pencil sharpener, basically. And we use a bit extensions and they go into this jig that we've built so that we can drill at a very precise angle. And it's, it's really relatively simple. Once you've done it a couple of times, it all makes sense. And that's my goal is to make not only uh, really cool chairs, but to make them in a way that's very efficient, time efficient. And for anybody at any skill level, they should be able to kind of blend right into our to our class. And here's a series of cutters kind of lined up on some two by four pieces and we spin them through the cutters and that's how we get our tapered, uh, beautifully tapered spindles for the back of our chair. Draw knives. These are called scrub planes. You see the nice little wavy patina that leaves on the bottom of your chair seat. These are called compass planes. It's just like a scrub plane. The only difference is the bottom is curved in two directions. So you can really excavate your chair seat. This is called a scorp or a hoop shave. Some people, this is all they use. They, they just like one tool and this can do it all. It's just you and the blade, it's like Nirvana. You know, it's a very, very esoteric thing, but uh, very, very practical tool. And these are the traversers that our class is using right now. I make them by the bucket full. Um, it's traversure is just a spoke shave with a curved bottom. And so you can make them extreme curve, very soft curve, but they're great for digging and shaping and, and getting your seat looking like you want it to look. And when it's working good, this is what it looks like. All these beautiful curly shavings are coming out. And so uh, now that is Nirvana when you're starting to, to use a tool and you just see the, the, the wood just flow apart. And so I'm gonna close with a couple pictures of cute kids because you're always supposed to do that in a slideshow to really get the audience's attention. You either have to have a dog or a cat or a cute child. This particular little guy came and visited us in a class up in Grand Marais, Minnesota. I thought he was so cute. I just had to put his picture in. And now the audience can go, oh, you know, he's so cute. And this is my granddaughter, Mari, and she's in one of our armchairs. In fact, I think she's in this armchair right here with a big smile on her face, see? So it must be comfortable. And this is my granddaughter, uh, Kira, when she was only a few days old, but it, this slide for me kind of says it all. It's all about the future generation. I think in the arts, we all seek a little bit of immortality. You know, we want to pass something along to the next generation, something to live beyond the grave kind of thing. And so with furniture, you definitely are doing that. I think with, with most of the arts you are. And so I'm sure this will be her stool at her kitchen counter someday. Uh, she's a lot bigger than this now, but uh, it's just a great shot. And I had to, had to throw it in to close my slideshow. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Okay, our last presenter tonight is Richard James from the Ceramics Studio. 
And here to introduce him is um, the one of the ceramics assistants, Mary Maglieri. I was close. Hi everyone. Uh, like Talia said, I'm one of the ceramic assistants this uh, summer at Peters Valley. And I'll be introducing Richard James, who's doing a workshop called uh, Heads and Hands in Clay. Richard James received a BFA from the University of Tennessee at Martin in 2001. He followed his BFA with an MFA in ceramics from the University of Kansas in 2016. He was awarded the James Renwick Alliance Chrysalis, I believe I said that incorrect, award in 2019. He's written for Ceramics Art and Perception, Ceramics Technical, as well as Ceramics Monthly. He completed residencies at the Archie Beret Foundation in Helena, Montana, as well as Aramont School of the Arts and Crafts, as well as Zenrutang in Zhenden, uh, Zhendezhen in China. Uh, he is currently the Assistant Professor of Sculpture and Ceramics at uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi and recently accepted a position at Miami University in Ohio. Please give a warm welcome for Richard James. Do we have a timer? Okay. No, okay. okay um, thanks everybody for having me here. It's been lovely. This is my first, uh, first time in Peters Valley actually, my first two days, so. Um, I started out uh, making pots, making wood fire pots a long time ago. Um, and it's something that still informs my work now, just the um, logistics and the uh, laborious nature of clay. I think there's a lot of uh, lessons in that I still take. Um, I still utilize in the work that I make now. Um, I went to undergraduate trying to paint on pots and I did that for a while and then I made this work for a while and then I made this work for a while and then I made some of this work for a while. And then getting into my thesis year, um, I listened to one of my mentors said like, not all personal work is good, but all good work is personal in some ways. And this stuff was not personal enough for me. So I decided to go into um, my perceptions of reality, I think, uh, and how I, how I see things. Um, and a lot of that had to go with going back to where I was kind of stewed in the soup that I was in rural Tennessee. Um, and I had been playing around with the figure before, but some, everything kind of fell into space then. Um, I was started working with a doll format and utilizing found objects and utilizing fabric within my work. Uh, and for me, this was a great opportunity to um, kind of incorporate how I was raised. I could utilize the, the traditional masculine aspects of woodworking and the traditional feminine aspects of sewing, both of which uh, my parents taught me, both as like a living trait. Uh, we grew up very rural and very poor in a very religious South. So, and I was taught to mend my clothes just as a matter of that's what you teach your kids type thing. Um, so it allowed me to bring in those material choices into something I was interested in, which was the clay. Um, and the clay sort of the service is me within this trifecta, something that could be soft and hard, you know, decorative and engineering, um, and to kind of work all these things together in one piece. Um, I use a lot of, um, a lot of um, symbolic found objects in my work. And for me, that was, a, again, antiques. I was around antiques a lot growing up. And it kind of came to symbolize um, how we misrepresent history to ourselves, like because um, a lot of my a lot of my uh, people in the work often misuse the objects, much like we misremember things that happen to us, and we can um, recontextualize these memories to best suit what we what we need at the present. Um, this is I'm not going to I will give a full in depth artist talk maybe Tuesday morning in my class if you guys like I'm just gonna kind of skim the top here to keep under 10 minutes. Um, so this is a piece that made in the um, first piece in Aramont where I decapitated a couple plaster bust. One was a, of a cardinal, I believe, and one was a very poor representation of Thomas Jefferson. But I thought it would be uh, fun to use those things as representative of the church and state. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Punch and Judy, uh, like the puppet show in England where they just beat the crap out of each other. 
Um, again, well, I'll go into this more later. Um, another piece, you know, this is probably eye height with me, maybe a little bigger, made in Aramont. Um, quilts are a big thing in my work. Uh, when I can when I find the ones that are appropriate. Um, in the South, when you when you have a kid, you get a quilt. When somebody dies, you get a quilt. When you get married, you get a quilt. So they're just kind of around all the time and very important signifiers of important events in the South. So I like to use those a lot uh, in my work when I can. This uh, these these pieces came from a dilapidated barn on our um, pig farm. It's still not doesn't have any pigs, but there's still stuff laying around. And it was nice to be able to use objects that um, my grandfather actually used. Um, I am so of my father's line, like me, my father, his father, his father, and so on and so forth. I'm the first male to not have built his own house, you know, by 21. But I'm also only the second from that line. It's literate from a passes like a third grade level because you know you pull out and work farms. So and so it was a lot, it meant a lot to me to use some of that stuff within this work that to go for. Um, another piece, wall hanging piece. Uh, now some of you guys might know Bill Griffith. Um, so I was at Aramont and when you're a long-term resident, the places um, part of the requirement is to leave a piece for the permanent collection. So um, I never I make a lot of work, but I don't let it leave the studio or get photographed if unless it like meets some criteria for myself. And it has to have multiple layers of meaning. And some of those times, I don't know what's happening, right? And I think really that's the litmus test for a good work is if I'm not sure what's there, like I can smell it, but I don't really know how to explain it yet um, to let those things go out into the world. Um, so for this one, I knew that I wanted to use, I wanted to do a portrait of Bill, but I wanted to use the type of work that he makes and also a, um, a um, allusion to the residents, artists in residence studio at Aramont also, and to, to combine those all into one form with like bent oak um, to try to get all that into one place. Cause I wanted, you know, he's the one that started that residency program there. So it meant a lot to me. Um, first place really gave me a chance, I think. Um, this was made at, and uh, the first major piece I made at uh, Archie Ray Foundation in Montana. And my wife is a psychologist and um, so we have a lot of these conversations about just like perception and you know, like power dynamics and, and stuff like that. And um, I knew I wanted to use a bench as a conduit for two people. I didn't know why, I just had a cool object. And I wanted to use that. And I started thinking about um, like the Sistine Chapel, the, the famous fingers touching to each other, right? Uh, there's two, there were two contemporary biographies of Michelangelo at the time. One of them is widely believed to just be him talking to somebody writing for him. Uh, and that one, he talks about that point not being God giving him to get to life, but giving him the holy dictates. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't kill, don't covet, those type of things. So um, I, st I was starting recontextualizing that with uh, an experiment, uh, a Milgram's experiment. Are you familiar with that? Where um, after World War II, they, you know, these officers started saying, I was just following orders, I was just following orders, right? And that was a hard pill to swallow for the public. So Milgram did this experiment to test the limits of authority. Um, and I'll talk about this more later if you want to, but suffice to say, it was very shocking. And uh, it's amazing what somebody in a white lab coat can get you to do to somebody else just for having a clipboard, you know? So um, I don't have time to go into it now, but it's a very interesting story. And I got the phone allowed me to get to do that. This one was made um, like directly after the Las Vegas shootings. Like I was one off of somebody uh, taking bits of bone out of their hair, right? So, and like growing up in the South and have a mixed relationship with the guns, just in the South, everybody has them. And I, I don't have answers in my work and I don't want to give answers to anybody, most importantly. Uh, it's more like a conduit to try to like figure things out for myself. You know, like you're throwing stuff out, you're making a good mirror, hopefully, so you can see better better questions, I think. So I made this piece, the matador, which is whole purpose is to like kind of court danger, but also get out of the way at the last minute. And I had these objects whose in, inherent purpose was to keep things the way they were, like a vice and a stapler, you know, and to create that juxtaposition of uh, intent versus um, nature of object, I think. 
and it helps that the mad door you know, translate as the killer in Spanish. So, um, and then this piece was made for a portrait show, um, invitational portrait show in Cincinnati. And at the Bray, they had all these, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, the, um, at the Bray, there is, a, if you're not in ceramic world, you might not be familiar with it, but it's a very important place in ceramics. And uh, they were redoing a building and they, were, they tore out all this, this old floor. Like this is the floor that um, like Volkos worked on and Rudy Audio worked on. Like anybody that like from that first generation of ceramics people probably spilled beer on this floor, right? And they were just gonna burn it. So I went out there and denailed it, got the flooring out and started, and I wanted to use it in my work. Okay, there's a tractor if you guys can't hear. Uh, better. Mike's and I don't get along in the past. Better. I don't like that. Okay. The um, but I the, they wanted me to make a, make a portrait, so I wanted to make a portrait about the idea of making a portrait. So I made the head, scanned it, embroidered that head on the on the piece, and then uh, put a needle in there to kind of make like a cyclic idea of self portrait. Um, because it was a, it was a heady thing for me to be at the Bray, you know, I was I had Japan house house back that for a long time. It took me years to get in get into this place. And to like to be working in the same hollowed ground as the people who got me on that path was kind of something to think about. Um, and then I make uh, chimpanzees very rarely, but um, I get offers to a lot. Everybody wants an animal. Once you make one animal, that's all they want. Um, but I do like chimps because they they're kind of like humans without the facade of civility. I think like they act they act a lot of like this. They you know they run around, they kill, they masturbate. They have all plans. They have social structures. They're very human-like. They're the, like they're very close to us. And I think like it's fun to make chimps to kind of get at the core of like some of our intentions. I think in some ways. And at this point, I, don't know, I haven't been really happy unless there's been a broader aspect of my work since then. It's a ton of work. But once I dip my toe into that, I can't be satisfied with anything that that doesn't have that part now. So that's in, that's those those embroidered um, symbols in the middle detail and then here's the last few pieces uh, this is a piece i made in texas um, and i started to use epoxy with my work um, which is something new that i'm excited about this is a double portrait of my son that i've been meaning to do for a long time and i finally decided to do it um, it was a lot of work but it was nice because he got to sit for me and got to spend a lot of quality time just him looking right at me and me looking right at him and like thinking about every little you know curve of his cheek and trying to capture that but also the uh, the nice thing was that I have a floor loom so I taught him to loom the uh, fabric for it so that he could make he can make the uh, the body of the thing of his own piece so that was nice to teach him how to do that and then in turn he taught my mother how to use a loom which she taught me how to sew so it's like a nice cyclic you know that so um i have the loom i don't have the time my goal is to loom all of my fabric from now on but it's just you know the time to do it i really i really like to sit down and shut out the world and just like work it but um you know how that goes so um this is one of the final pieces i made this for in the milwaukee or not milwaukee the minneapolis and sika with another and broader piece and um most of the time when I make a work, I'm making it specifically for an idea or specifically for a time and place that will be shown, thinking about those ideas. And um, this one was just too good of a too good of a chance to pass up to be shown at the Nseka show. And I was partially uh, curious about who was going to check their hair in the mirror versus look at the work. But when you get up to the head, there's an angle if you're eye level with that piece, you can see I think it's back and forth, back and forth until you see your own eye and that smaller version again with this hall of mirrors. So it was really, it was really fun to sit back in the corner with a beer and just watch how people approach the work and where their eyes go to see that. And I'll let you lead, I'll let you read into the rest of the, the imagery and the objects. Uh, and this is the final piece that I've just completed. Uh, it's in a museum now in Texas, uh, Will. This is probably yay tall i think so it's 12 bust 12 ceramic bust 
with a welded uh, metal frame inside of it on this uh, stove caster, um, which was, I wanted, I had started this actually, I started this in 19 before the pandemic started. Um, and I wanted to do something that took a lot of time. So I wanted to make 12 bus over a year to uh, try to stretch the limit of my attention, I think. So 12 heads, 24 hands, um, and then the pandemic happened and it kind of took on a whole nother meeting uh, when that happened, uh, within, within the context of that. So um, I think that finally got out of my, um, got out of my surface to make big work. I'm, I'm kind of done with it now. So um, for a bit anyway. So now moving back to some smaller work and, and incorporating utilitarian um, history back into this stuff and making nice, tight, small jars with uh, figure sculptures on the top. Um, so I think that's where I'm going now. I've got a solo show coming up at Red Lodge Clay Center soon, so it'll mostly be this and, and some new work going forward. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. All right, so that concludes. I was skip. That concludes tonight's presentations. Um, thanks for coming, everyone, whether you're here in person or on Zoom. Um, thanks for being here at Peters Valley. If you need anything, there's free time here. Please let the office know or anyone with one of these shirts. We'll all get it done for you um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.